Hi everyone, I'm Jen with Blockchain Banter. I am so excited to be joined by Michael Kong, CEO of Phantom Foundation, along with Dr. Mark Richardson, project lead at Bancor and Carbon DeFi. Uh, Michael, Mark, thank you guys so much for joining me. There's so much going on in the Phantom ecosystem right now. Um, really, really excited to hear all about it directly from you, Michael. So. Thank you for being here. And maybe you wouldn't mind just starting us off, telling us a little bit. I know you have this big Sonic upgrade coming up. Um, tell us a little bit about that and just about the ecosystem, you know, overall, what's uh, happening over on Phantom. Yeah, sure. So for almost like two years now, we've been working on this new upgrade that we term Sonic, right? And, and, and the Sonic upgrade is basically like an entirely new technology stack that isn't just um, to do with building a new virtual machine, although that is one component. But it's essentially like an improvement to the existing like Opera client. It's an improvement to consensus. It's an improvement to um, you know virtual machine, as I just mentioned. But also using like a new database structure, essentially to significantly improve scalability. So the numbers that we've been seeing for Sonic, which is live by the way, in terms of like test nets, right? People can go into a test net and they can see the data. They can see how much gas is being consumed per transaction. They can see the number of transactions being included in blocks, and they can see that um, how it's being propagated across you know testnet networks. So you can see that the data is real; it's not theoretical or just mathematical or, or or just something plucked out of thin air. It's actually real. You know, we've been able to achieve very remarkable results, including over two thousand transactions per second, um, with a time to finality of like 0.8 seconds, right? And if you lower the transaction count to you know, like 100 or 200 transactions per second, which is still way more than um, the number of transactions that get processed on Phantom at the moment, you're looking at a time to finality of closer to like even 0.3 or 0.4, which is basically getting to the minimum confirmation times required to confirm a transaction. And that is really just a combination of like really smart engineering and also just uh, basically like optimizations and, and fixing a lot of the scalability issues that exists with um, current like database technology when it comes to blockchains and also with um, uh, the virtual machine itself. So there's like many components to this upgrade, which is why it's been taken, which is why it's taken um, almost two years to get to where we are. The technology is fully built. Um, it is like rigorously tested. There's some final testing going on. As I mentioned before, there's, you know, two tests live since October 2023. And the Sonic um, upgrade is is going to go live very, very soon. So really excited by it because I think it would dramatically increase the scalability of the network. And during peak load times like we had in 2021, where there were gas spikes on the network, um, and, and it caused you know issues for people and 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 confirmation times were getting slower. Um, that should basically be history of the. Uh, that should basically be you know a thing of the past that uh, will not really happen again on the Phantom network or really shouldn't. That's incredible. Did you say two thousand transactions per second? Yeah, and I and I know there are other projects out there that are up and coming um, that claim, oh, you know, they can process ten thousand or twenty thousand or even like significantly higher than that. Um, but about those projects, you know, a, a lot of those projects haven't really launched something, you know, uh, tangible that people can actually see the data. They haven't been around for that long. Phantom has been around for more than four years. Like we launched our mainnet at the end of December 2019. And for four plus years, we've been running very, very consistently, almost always like up, you know, we haven't really had any issues with the tech. And this is a major upgrade that is very tangible. So as I just mentioned before, people can go to, you know, our test nets and they can see all the transactions being sent uh, through the test net. They can see the amount of gas being consumed. They can see, you know, stats around, you know, uh, the, the gas consumed per second on the daily basis, the number of transactions done per second and on a daily basis and and how long it takes to confirm a transaction and look at like each and every block and see that the transaction the transaction data is real and it's all you know complicated smart contract data. It's not just um you know simple account to account transfers which don't really represent that much in terms of transactions on the Phantom network. It's more like the smart contract functionality, which is the reason why you know people use Phantom or Ethereum and, and other smart contract chains. So it's all like very real and tangible and definitely not theoretical, um, as opposed to maybe others that you know pluck numbers out of thin air or, or pluck theoretical numbers that you know may mathematically work, but in practice 
due to you know the complexity of systems may actually not achieve like the same performance numbers they're talking about right it definitely makes a big difference and having four years you know under your belt makes a big difference as well if i can backtrack to that time a little bit what made the phantom foundation go in this direction of this all new tech stack was it these issues that you are offering solutions to with phantom it was identifying those issues and realizing that you know your engineers were better creating something entirely different because like you said this is a different sort of technology this is an innovation from the phantom foundation from phantom right yeah so um the reason we wanted we went in this particular direction is that essentially like you know what we're trying to achieve from a technical point of view at phantom is similar to like the aims of the other projects right or other blockchains <laughs> which is we just want to increase scalability right and then what does scalability come down to um it really comes down to two like key metrics right it comes down to throughput or what's commonly known as transactions per second right you know how many transactions per second can a network handle um with you know with, without going down and then there's also um time to finality or what we call like confirmation times right um, how long does it take for a transaction submitted by a user to propagate across the network and be fully confirmed and finalized in a block um, that is like now part of the ledger, right? That the network recognizes as being like a finalized transaction. And so that everything that we do is aimed towards, you know, optimizing that, you know, increasing throughput as much as possible while we're trying to decrease the confirmation times as much as possible. And the way that um, Sonic came about is that you know, I used to um, I used to study under a professor at the University of Sydney called Professor Schultz, who's an expert in programming languages and, and databases. And he has done a lot of like optimizations in the past when it comes to, you know, different sorts of technology. And he also had like a very keen interest in optimizing and, and securing blockchain technology as well. So we, he basically came into the organization in early 2022 and said that he had ideas about, you know, establishing a new virtual machine, about using uh, particular databases. We, we call it like, quote unquote, like flat storage databases um, in order to uh, basically speed up the number of, um, uh, basically speed up the network and achieve those scalability numbers that I mentioned about, while also significantly decreasing, it uh, also should be mentioned, um, uh, the amount of storage as well, which is which is also very important for people running nodes uh, for obvious reasons, because the less storage requirements that you have, the faster it is to run a node and, and the cheaper it is as well. And also the more secure it is because there's less data that you necessarily need to handle. So, you know, he thought about a whole bunch of ideas uh, conceptually that could, you know, increase the scalability of the network. And then basically he started experimenting empirically, right? You know, he brought on, uh, he, he brought on like a team of people from, uh, from organizations that um, he had previously worked at and individuals that he had previously worked with either studying under him as PhDs or working um, uh, with him in, in different industries like at Oracle or, or Sun Microsystems um, and elsewhere. So um, we, he basically put together a team and they started experimenting on, okay, what is like, uh, you know, the, the best solution for increasing scalability when it comes to like the database, when it comes to virtual machines and a whole bunch of other changes. And so empirically, we figured out that, okay, you know, certain changes that now are in the Sonic client really gave us like the best performance. So again, like a lot of like um, the work that's been done on the Sonic client wasn't just like, you know, something theoretically done in ideal conditions. And we just hope that it worked in practice. It was more like empirically built from the ground up where it was just testing from the very beginning and realizing that, yes, it really, you know, it does work and that it's, um, uh, uh, the, the data is just as secure as it was before, right? So obviously, like, in order to make sure that um, your network is secure, you have to make sure that um, transactions get propagated at the network and they all get finalized in exactly the same order across all the nodes. So, you know, the, the new database solution, for example, he came up with, you know, we made sure that um, you were able to basically generate proofs for your, all your transaction history but also take advantage of, you know, the increased scalability. Um, so that basically is a little bit the history of uh, of Sonic without getting too complicated. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. I knew that this was in the works. I knew that you were doing something completely different, but kind of the uh, the idea behind it. 
right, is always kind of interesting to hear about. Are there, you know, so many people say that, you know, they're going to onboard the next million users and we hear it at all the conferences. We, you know, have the talks about it and things of that sort. Um, how big an issue do you think onboarding new users is and where do you think Phantom lies in that? Yeah, so onboarding new users, I think it comes down to two things. It comes it comes down to one, having a technology that's scalable. Um, otherwise, you know, if, if, if you onboard users to a technology that's not workable, obviously they're not going to really stay because you, you can't do much on top of technology that doesn't really work. Um, so you need a very robust, um, strong, um, underlying platform that people can build applications on. But also equally, if not more importantly, you have to encourage people to build in your network. And this is sort of like a massive pivot that Phantom has taken in terms of its like its approach to the market. Um, initially, you know, or, or for the past two years, um, we've kind of had this mindset of like a, a quote unquote tech first approach. So in other words, okay, let's just like build the tech and then people will come, right? Um, you know, people would just realize that our technology is superior and it's easy to deploy on, and they'll just come and want to build stuff because it just works really well. But we realize uh, more recently now, and we should have realized this earlier, that that's not good enough, right? Yes, you need robust tech, but you also need to actively engage with communities and build up um, and build them up, right, from the ground up as a foundation. So we've been involved, we're now getting involved in all sorts of different campaigns that our competitors have done, you know, when it comes to like airdrops, giving out you know, significant grants, a lot more than we've done in the past, uh, um, in encouraging liquidity provision for DeFi applications and, and, and a whole bunch of like other initiatives and, and getting on board uh, venture capitalists that we're like, in discussions with to, open, to be able to open doors with us and market with. So I think if we do all of those objectives really, really successfully, we should be able to significantly grow the phantom ecosystem, especially on this new technology, which will be able to handle a whole bunch of new users. I think that's what like some of our competitors have done. And they've been very accessible in establishing communities that are very, very large. And to be honest, like quite, uh, you know, quite a bit larger than Phantom is at the moment. However, you know, I think we can take a page out of their playbook and realize what they've done successfully and to try and replicate it from a business development point of view to grow the Phantom network itself. Like, have you started these sort of developer incentives yet and really started focusing on building the community? Because I can tell you from the outside, looking in as a community member, I have personally seen that growth. Is it the technology that they're excited about or is it this sort of page that you've borrowed from the playbook? Um, and have you, have you started these sorts of incentives yet? So I think for the past few months, you know, there, there has been, as you mentioned, like quite a big growth for Phantom. I think a lot of that um, it can be attributed to the fact that you know the, the the market has significantly improved over the past few months, and of course, like a rising tide lifts all boats. So you know, definitely, you know, the Phantom community has grown in particular in the past few months, um, but so have other communities as well, right? Um, in terms okay. of like these business development initiatives, we have we we've an we've announced it and strongly alluded to it. But we haven't um, um, announced like the more specifics to do with it because that's been worked out at the moment. Um, but I think when we put out the more specifics, people will like that quite a lot. When they see, you know, the sort of um, you know key influencers or like angel investors and VCs that have taken a bigger stake in in Phantom, you know, people will be quite impressed by it. So a lot of these business development initiatives initiatives that we've come up with and planning has only really happened, honestly, in like the past month or so. Um, but it's been rolled out and I think people will like it quite a lot. And I think that is what is really gonna turbocharge us with good market conditions to really growing uh, the Phantom Network to where it really should have been in the past. Well, it's a great time for it because like you said, people get excited when the market is doing things, you know, sentiment is always positive. So it's nice to be releasing this sort of big upgrade and these sorts of initiatives, you know, starting these sorts of initiatives when the community is excited and I mean, even just present. Mark, I wanted to cut to you for a moment because I know, you know, we're speaking about developers going over to Phantom. Bancor recently uh, deployed its technologies over on Phantom. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that as well and how that experience was. Yeah, Phantom, like Phantom's always been, um somewhere that I, I wanted the project to be. I, I really respect the um, design first approach um, of uh, Phantom and its foundation. And one of the things that's always intrigued me about 
um, about Phantom as well is the fact that it's not it's not really a blockchain, right? That it's a um, an acyclic graph, um, and I, I have a, a a deep appreciation for um, uh, for that choice, um, especially as you know Michael was saying that it brings you um, you know breakneck speed um, finalities uh, in a way that a blockchain never could. Um, and so, you know, for, for a trading product, um, time to finality is, um, you know, it is a, a, a huge priority uh, when we speak, in, when we are speaking to some of the more sophisticated individuals and institutions that are, you know, eyeing up DeFi or, um, or you know, maybe uh, diversifying the, uh, the their repertoire of, um, of financial products that they that they interact with. Um, a lot of these people are sort of, you know, they, if if not coming directly from the um, the high frequency world, um, have at least um, you know been steeped in it, and so have a certain expectation as to you know how long it's going to take for something to um, to to clear the mempool. And when they find out that um, blockchains like Ethereum have a, a 12, uh, 12 second block time. Um, they are, you know, horrified and don't really understand um, how it's possible to maintain a, um, you know, a, a properly functioning functioning trading product. Um, and again, like this is, is it's still a, um, you know, I, I'm not saying that they necessarily um, that, that their views reflect mine. I, I don't think that we that it's important for um, for uh, HFT to sort of exist in, in a financial sense. It, it hasn't existed always. Um, it's probably going to exist from this point onwards. Um, but I, I think it's a, a very narrow um, you know viewpoint to to say that a, a trading uh, a trading environment will fail without it. That's just objectively false. But um, it is nice to see that there are um, you know uh, decentralized ledger systems like Phantom that potentially could support that kind of expectation. Um, and yes, 300 microseconds um, is, is still, you know, uh, an arm's reach away from the um, from the micro or even nanoseconds that you can get in um, in some of these other trading environments. But, you know, it's um, hundreds of thousands of times better than um, than what you than what you're getting on um, on some uh, some of the competing blockchains out there. Um, so Phantom has always been on my radar, is, is what I'm trying to say. I remember we did, um, you know, we we were on the, uh, the the YouTube channel with the um, the terrific hosts that um, that that run the the community, um, you know, podcast there a couple of years ago, um, and I said basically uh, the same thing that I'm saying now. Um, so yeah, the experience deploying on Phantom. So the um, one of the other things I have a deep appreciation for is that. Um, even though the technology is radically different, um, it, the uh, in terms of the um, the VM, that it's still Ethereum compatible, um, and this is a very clever choice. Uh, one of the things that um, you know has that has been sort of a um, I, I want to say a, a, a nagging inconvenience um, is that there are blockchains like Solana, for example, that I would quite like to be on. Um, but because it's the only real, you know, Rust-based blockchain, um, and you know that its um, virtual machine is so unique and so specific, it means that the code that you produce to be there um, also makes that code exclusive. Um, and when you're in the business of selling licenses, that's a very small pool um, to be, you know, looking for for licensees in. Whereas when you've got something that is um, EVM compatible, your code is much more reusable, and so you can find a, a, a relatively larger um, potential consumer base, at least from the B two B side. Um, so yeah, the, I think you know what I'm yeah the the, the specific design decisions um, that that Phantom has been making are are, are phenomenally good. I think that it, it demonstrates a, a profound. Um, understanding not just of the limitations of blockchain technology and how to improve it, but also um, the business models that are going to be built on top of it. There are, you know, there are always some sort of lingering things um, like, you know, the RPC infrastructure and things like um, June um, compatibility and that kind of thing 
Um, but, you know, despite the, the fact that it was a, a relatively new environment and we did need to talk to some new providers, um, because Phantom is so well established, um, it was very easy for us to find someone that was able to provide um, the, um, the, the data and look back that we needed um, in order to make the product uh, work the way that, that it needs to. So there's two, two components to this. Um, one is that um, you know, when our technology arrives on a new blockchain, um, there's a, a handful of processes that we need to sort of um, get done to make sure that, we, um, that our, that our la licensees are, uh, are able to offer their customers the, the best product possible. Um, the first is that we need to get a very good idea for um, how many uh, different tokens there are on, um, in that environment. Um, and where can we get, um, you know, where where can we get the um, the highest fidelity data to so, to provide on on the the front end um, information about their prices and give you give users you know certain warnings and things about the the decisions that they're making and so on and so forth. Uh, we also then need to be able to identify um, where all of the sources of liquidity are on that um, environment. So on Phantom. We'll look at what are the most popular trading venues, DEXs, wherever there's liquidity. Um, how can you take a flash loan in these things? You know, there, there's a lot of the, our, um, let's say, um, auxiliary supporting infrastructure that uses the other protocols in that environment. Um, and this is, again, um, speaking to one of Phantom's strengths because it has, um, a, you know, a, a deeply entrenched DeFi community there already. Um, which meant that a lot of the, the 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 things that you want to do are already available. So you know, um, looking at things like um, AMM liquidity sources and um, you know flash loan liquidity sources and so on. Um, so that was nice and easy. Um, and those two things in particular are very important because on top of the um, the, the licensed carbon DeFi deployment. Um, we're also um, launching our own deployment of the ARB Fastlane, which is um, very, very, very similar to um, things like the the CowSwap Solver network, for example, but a little bit less exclusive. Um, so this is something that anyone can fork from our GitHub and run themselves. Um, and people use it essentially as kind of like an alternative to Bitcoin mining in a sense, because it's a, a client that you can just run locally um, that will occasionally just accumulate tokens um, in whatever, you know, um, usually in the gas token of the chain. So in this case, in Phantom. Um, and this means that, you know, we also needed to make some um, some final adjustments to the um, to the, the software um, to make sure that it knew how to um, use the Phantom blockchain, which again, was very, very easy. Um, I, I couldn't be more pleased with the process. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, it's nice to hear that it all went smoothly, especially because Bancor hasn't really done many deployments outside of Ethereum in the last, you know, since 2017. I think Phantom is the second or third and only second recently within the last however many years, right? So it's nice to see that now that you're getting out there, that this is an experience that you can speak highly of. Right. And I know, um, you know, we had spoken with Velocimeter, who is currently on Phantom, a couple other chains as well, but they are the licensees for um, Carbon DeFi smart contracts. They are the licensee that had brought your product, Mark, over to Phantom, and they were really keen on having them, like having it over on Phantom. I think they were saying that the DeFi community over there is doing so well. This is where they're seeing, a, I mean, compared to their other deployments, um, the most activity is over on Phantom. So they were they were very big on having this there. And Mark, although they do the deployment, you deploy the ARB fast lane alongside it to support that deployment, correct? Yeah, correct. Um, yeah. The, the ARB fast lane is something that we do as a part of the proprietor of the technology, I think is the best way to describe it. And this is something that in general, um, a lot of the blockchains that we've been speaking with are um, excited to have because um, it means that in general, there's going to be more transactions on the network, more volume um, in terms of um, in terms of tokens traded, 
but it also means that um, the, that arbitrage network will bring all of the um, existing trading infrastructure into equilibrium. Um, so the quote prices for, for various tokens will be consistent across every AMM um, or you know, uh, concentrated AMM or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, these will all start to line up a little bit better. Um, and just in general, the, um, the, the marketplace will um, be a little bit better behaved um, than before we launch it. So yes, this is our own deployment. We will continue to manage it. Um, and yeah, it's, um, but if you want to join that network, um, you don't have to ask us for permission. This is a permissionless arbitrage system. Um, and so if you jump into the, the Bancor developer Telegram chat, we will show you how to fork the repo. Um, and you can begin, um, you know, running this on your own if you if you want to participate. And arbitraging the Phantom ecosystem, that's amazing. You're speaking about trading products specifically. Michael, do you see the majority of the activity on Phantom being DeFi? Or are you guys kind of, are you gaming? Are you NFT as well? Or do you, is this where you kind of see the majority? Um. I, yeah, the majority is definitely related to DeFi. I think for a number of reasons, you know, DeFi, um, a phantom has been historically known as like a uh, the DeFi chain, right? Um, in the, in the past, a couple of years ago, we had you know over ten million dollars worth of TVL. Um, it was one of the biggest TVL chains out there, next to Ethereum. Um, and of course, like you know, there, there's a big figure involved in Phantom, Andre Cronje, who's been involved in Phantom since. Um, basically the beginning of the project in early to mid 2018. Um, so he's been involved for, you know, um, going on to like, you know, five or six years now. And um, so a lot of like training and, and applications are related to DeFi on chain. There are like a couple of games as well. Um, for example, like S4 Kingdoms, which is getting like really, really popular. I think they have tens of thousands, of, like, like over 100,000 users now. Um, nice. But most of the applications are DeFi related. And I think the you know the the current technology and the sonic technology that we have up and coming is quite suited to DeFi activity um because in, in particular if you need to do certain trades like um with, with bank or like like arbitrate uh, uh, um arbitraging um that requires you know very low um time to finality right? that requires um your confirmation times being as sw small as possible so you can take advantage of price differences as quickly as possible. So that's like one important application of why you need like low confirmation times on the chain. Another important like type of application that uh, we've had a lot of inquiries about are uh, related to perpetual DEXs as well. So when we announced in um, October 2023 last year, um, the test nets that we had come out, there were a number of perp DEXs um, from other chains that messaged us and were very interested in knowing like, when this will be deployed and how they could interact with it because they were having issues in terms of like um, having updated data displaying um, at the time that someone would have submitted a trade. Because obviously if you're like running any DEX, but in particular a perpetual DEX, um, you know, the, the sensitivity that a particular trader has to the movement in prices and the current prices is very, very significant. I mean, you know, if there's a delay even of like a second or two uh, between when someone submits a transaction, and the actual like listed price for um, the particular trade, then you know you could have issues where you know someone believes that you know it's trading at a particular price. They submit a transaction based on that price, but it turns out that the price is already out of date, especially if the market is volatile, right? And then people are just not basically conducting the trades they hope they were conducting. Well, with a lower time to finality chain, um, that risk is basically minimized um, because you know. The, the the lag between the actual data or actual price and someone submitting a transaction is just a lot less. Um, I think another like important aspect of the new technology coming out is also um, related to not just the performance of the validators or, or confirming transactions on the network, but also I think very importantly, um, the RPC providers as, as Mark highlighted. I mean, RPC providers are incredibly important for the network because they help people um, uh, basically submit transactions uh, to the network, they're essentially the gateway for an application or users to interact and confirm transactions on the network. So RBC nodes are, in my opinion, almost just as important as the actual validators validating transactions on the network itself. And so we spend a lot of uh, time not just like upgrading the current um, uh, validators that we have to, you know, sonic validators and, and building solutions around that, but also improving RPC nodes to become sonic RPC nodes 
And we released an article, I think it was about last month or, or two months ago, when we detailed uh, some of the results that we've been getting, upgrading our own validators on the mainnet. So again, like, you know, not theoretical, but something that's actually happening on the actual mainnet itself. We have some upgraded RPC nodes and essentially the throughput for our RPC nodes on the amount of requests they can process per second has gone up, you know, many, many fold compared to where it is at the moment. And because of the hardware, because the hardware requirements are also a lot less, I think about 66 to 70% less than with um, the, uh, the current technology. When you combine that together, if you're running a very large scale, like RPC um, uh, a system of like 20 plus servers, your costs can actually decrease by up to 96% if you're utilizing wow. all those RPC nodes to full capacity. And I know that sounds like a bit of an exaggeration. Oh, well, how, how could you reduce costs by 96%? It sounds crazy. Well, if you, if, if you actually like look through the numbers and you look at, okay, you know, I, I can generate many more requests. I consume a lot less data and you multiply that out by, you know, many servers, then your costs, you know, your average cost per server goes down dramatically. Now, you know, if you're just running one RPC server, you're not going to be seeing a 96% reduction. You can, you're going to be seeing something like a, a bit less of a reduction, but still very, very substantial. But if you're running, you know, a really intense group of RPC nodes, that's where you see the maximum benefit with the new technology. So I think all of this like really can help, you know, applications, for example, uh, Bancor really run very smoothly on Phantom and with the new Sonic technology. And I do really appreciate um, Bancor being um, uh, basically uh, uh, deploying on Phantom uh, quite early on um, uh, um, uh, next to Ethereum. And so that's like really encouraging to hear. And Bancor is a project that's been around, you know, I think since like 2018 or so. So it's also pretty much just as old as Phantom, if not older than that. I think actually they might've done the ICO or something like that in um, 2017. Um, so it's great to see, you know, uh, an, an original old school like DeFi project, like expanding to, to other chains as well. It's quite exciting. Thank you, Mark. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. It's kind of nice though, because you see, you've got this big upgrade going over on Phantom. And there's kind of this shift in the direction that Bancor is headed in. So like you said, it's nice to see the two of them coming together, you know, at such a turning point for both of you, I think. Mark, I don't know if you wanted to add to that or respond to Michael at all. No, thank you for the kind words. And yeah, you're right. Like Bancor is very old. We, um, you know, we uh con conceived the amm in, in 2016 and launched it in january of 2017. um the uh but yeah bankrupt actually goes back a little bit farther than that so it predates um even ethereum by a, a little way um because it, it began as a community currency experiment um and uh our, our first uh chief of economics was a, a gentleman named bernard lita um, who joined the the project in um, you know in, in sort of investigating different ways to um, yeah to, to 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 support currencies um, that weren't necessarily government issued fiat um, and uh, he joined uh, he joined the project um, shortly after uh, leaving I think the um, one of the um, one of the institutions in the EU because his his previous job before working for Bancor was um, was inventing the euro um so we actually have a um you know a, a rich history in um you know in not just uh you know currency development but also the financial systems that are sort of implicit in that so yeah it, it's but i'm yeah i'm i'm so excited to um to have a, a deployment on phantom and uh, i can't wait to see um how things pick up after the sonic upgrade i'm uh, i'm very very enthusiastic i'm very confident in in phantom's technology and uh i know that the um i, I know that its community is uh is as excited as i am so i'm uh, i think it's going to be a good year you know what i have noticed about the community and like i said when i mean i was defying back probably two years ago, maybe something on Phantom. Prior to our original call, when we first had you on, I was already on Phantom. Um, but I have noticed that the community is extremely loyal. Like they just, they're there and they enjoy being there. Speaking of building your community, I do have a question. 
someone wants to get to Phantom right now, how do they do it? They're generally, they're on Ethereum, they're on another chain. What is your main source of the bridging? You know, how are, how are you onboarding those new users or how are they making their way to Phantom? Yeah, so, um, you know, as previously mentioned, <laughs> Phantom is an EVM compatible chain. And even with the new virtual machine coming out that we call the FVM or the Phantom virtual machine, um, that is also uh, like Solidity compatible. So the way that you would like write and deploy a smart contract on the EVM works with Phantom currently, and it would also work pretty much exactly the same way as the new Phantom virtual machine, because it's basically an optimization of the Ethereum virtual machine, um, basically just taking the principles of virtual machine development and optimizing, you know, essentially how smart contracts are executed, which is uh, the software layer that um, that involves what's known as like a virtual machine. Um, so, you know, in terms of like how we get users across, a lot of users uh, tend to bridge from Ethereum. That's always been like the case um, in the past, um, including in 2021, when we got a lot of like TVL, a lot of that just came from like Phantom. Uh, sorry, a lot of that came from Ethereum. And that's because, you know, Ethereum is the biggest smart contract platform out there. It has a lot of like liquidity, um, uh, assets, et cetera, a lot of users. And so, you know, people can use multiple bridges uh, to bridge onto Phantom, um, you know, whether it's like, you know, Layer Zero or Axla or Wormhole or others. Uh, right now, I know that there's a bit of a problem in terms of like stable coins being bridged to Phantom ever since um, multi-chain, you know, unfortunately, you know, effectively disappeared in uh, July, 2023. But we have a canonical stablecoin solution coming up that the foundation will endorse as being like the stablecoin standard for Phantom. And I mean, it will make things nice. a lot easier where instead of people like, um, you know, bridging you know, uh, across uh, uh, to different like USCC um, uh, or USCT um, uh, uh, versions where they're not really sure like which one is like, you know, more popular than the other and you get issues of liquid liquidity fragmentation and trust. Um, I think a lot of that should be solved in the future. And as you know, if we make the, the bridging experience as easy as possible and as straightforward as possible, then that's ideal. But you know, we, we have um we have a bunch of docs at docs.phantom.foundation that basically is a guide for people to get started. Like if you wanted to deploy a smart contract, here's step by step um how you would do it. If you want to, you know, connect it with your MetaMask and start interacting with the chain, you know, here are the steps one to three on how to do it. Uh, same thing with, you know, setting up your own validator nodes or setting up your own RPC nodes. So we have a lot of like um, simplified instructions out there for anyone to really get started on chain, including on how to like interact with bridges and move assets to and from uh, Phantom itself. But I would say in summary, like most of our users um, originally have come from Ethereum. And you know, another point that you mentioned is, you know, I, I think there is like a loyal, you know, I, I would say like diehard Phantom community that you know has always been around for at least the past few years, which is like incredible to see. Um, however, you know it's you know it's a decent sized community, but it's obviously not as big as like other like um, uh, some other blockchain platforms that are out there. And so I think in order for us to like expand from the you know the loyal community that we have at the moment into getting more users, we do need to take it. We we do need to really implement a whole bunch of uh, business development initiatives that I mentioned before. Um, now. Obviously, like some people jump from chain to chain, just looking for opportunities. But the plan is, is that, you know, if you have the right incentives for people to want to experiment with Phantom, that if they can see that they can build, you know, successful applications on it and use uh, like the platform in a very easy and convenient way, thanks to the new technology that's being launched, you know, there are a number of users that they themselves will become loyal and, you know, want to stay on chain and, or, or at least interact with the chain a lot more going forward regardless of you know what incentives may 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 or may not exist at the time um we've definitely seen that strategy be really successful for other chains where you know they've really built up loyal communities via a lot of incentives and and decent technology and then once you get to like a decent community size it's kind of network effects right you know one friend you know interacts in the network they have a great experience they tell two other friends to play around with the network and then they have a great experience and they tell four people so then that's how you get like exponential growth and that's pretty much what happened with Ethereum in, in the earlier days, because you know, I, I got involved in Ethereum back in like early 2016, late 2015, because there were the early like evangelists of Ethereum going around at the University of Sydney, sitting down with people and being like, oh, 
<laughs> by the way have you guys heard of this thing called ethereum it's like uh bitcoin except you can do these things called smart contracts which means a lot more functionality and uh basically it's going to be the future so uh do you want to be part of the future do you want to play around with it <laughs> uh, uh you know please join and i listened to one of those evangelists and it really like resonated with me and i was like oh okay uh you know this smart contract stuff seems interesting and i thought blockchain technology was just all about like bitcoin right and about you know payments and and store of value so i started interacting with smart contracts and i realized you know that you know, it, 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 it had a lot of potential there and it was a very like interesting area that just got started. And so, you know, I started evangelizing a bit to my friends as well, you know, so that's I usually like I think how do. communities grow. Yeah, yeah, it, it community you get starts sucked more. In, it's hard, it's hard to not want to spread the word and like let people know what sort of opportunities we all have, you know? I've discovered this thing, well, I haven't, but I mean, I've been introduced to this and you need to get to know it. I could see how you became one yourself. Yeah, exactly. So like, just like there were, if you're an evangelist back in the day and, and there still are, um, you know, the community being a lot bigger, we want to, you know, replicate the same sort of thing for Phantom as well, because I think that's how you get a really, really successful, sustainable community in the long run, which is ultimately what our aim is. Now, I know you guys were at ETH Denver, right? You had a big presence there recently. Are there any upcoming conferences that either of you guys will be at? I know, I mean, who you, who doesn't want to build their community, right? Who doesn't want to get out there and really spread the word? If you're really focusing on that, is there anything in the works for that, especially with the upgrade coming? I know there's a bunch happening in Dubai, you know, in the next month or so. Will you guys be in Dubai? Um, yeah, so I think it's very important to show presence on the ground, uh, particularly mm -hmm. after, you know, the COVID pandemic. So myself, I'm going to be in about a month's time in or a little bit under a month's time at Paris Blockchain Week. So we're going to be hosting like an event there. I'm going to be speaking there as well. So I'm, you know, more than happy to meet people in person. I met a lot of like, you know, fan community supporters and other people at ETH Denver. That was obviously a big event. Paris Blockchain Week is also a big event as well. Um, and a few days after that is token 2049 unfortunately I, I can't attend that but there will be um phantom team members who will be attending that event as well in dubai uh, that's another big event and afterwards we also starting planning for consensus which i believe is in late may um, of this year so we will have a bigger presence at our consensus um like we did a couple of years ago presenting hosting events etc so those are like the immediate up and coming events of the next uh, uh, few months or so. Amazing. Um, I won't be in Paris, but I look forward to meeting some of the uh, some of the team members in Dubai. I'll be there next month. So and consensus. So I look forward to catching up with you guys a little bit then as well. Mark, what about you guys? About Bancor and Carbon DeFi, and will you be uh, on the ground anytime soon? Yeah, all over the place. Um, I think the, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, the first one coming up is ETH Dubai. Um, we'll be in, in town for, um, for Token 2049, but not attending the conference proper, um, which is how the cool kids are doing it these days. Um, <laughs> I think we'll also be, um, yeah, so I, I have a technical talk at, uh, at ETH Dubai. Um, I'm also trying to secure a, um, a technical talk at, um, at ECC, which is in Brussels this year due to the, um, due to the Olympics, I think is if, if someone can correct me on that, if, uh, I can't remember if I'm misremembering that. Um, and then, yeah, there's a, a bunch of other, um, things that are, that are coming up. I'm actually starting to, um, recognize that I need to spend a little bit more time with the Bitcoin community because they have a lot of, um, of their own EVM rollups um, that are, are launching on top of Bitcoin later this year, um, and I was at a uh, yeah I was I was in Dubai earlier this year um, at, at the Satoshi Roundtable um, where I was speaking with a lot of those guys, and um, I've been uh, I've received a, a couple of invitations to um, to join some of the Bitcoin conferences as well to speak a little bit about DeFi and um, maybe um, share some. Um, some of the the ethereum experiences and things to avoid um you know how um how some of the 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 most profound uh exploits and hacks and things that have happened in in DeFi and how those things can be avoided 
um, by you know by having the the right standards in place, the right practices, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, they, they, they'll be you know these things will be um, made available via our public channels um, as they become relevant. Um, but in general, I am a pretty last minute sort of person um, when it comes to conference planning. So um, I try to I try to play everything um, you know um, by shooting from from the hip. Um, and not overcommit to things, especially if, um, you know, it just gives me that kind of flexibility. But I'm very, very happy to say that, yes, uh, ETH, ETH Dubai is 100% um, locked in. Um, and um, and I will be attending ECC. Not sure if I'm speaking there yet, um, but I, I hope to be. These are the the, the two uh, two destinations that are, um, are uh, beyond question at the moment. But there will be, there, there are many more that I'm considering. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Michael, for everyone to stay updated on the upgrade and just the phantom ecosystem in general, would you recommend Twitter being the number one outlet that everyone should kind of keep their eyes on? Yeah, uh, Twitter or crypto Twitter, CT, as it's known these days, <laughs> uh, is where we post um, most of our social updates and we're most active on. So um, our phantom foundation account is at F-A-N-T-O-M. FDN, so at F-A-N-T-O-M-F-D-N. Um, people can see the latest updates we post regularly. I think even at, at this point, point in time, maybe every, every few hours or so, we're retweeting something or sharing something or posting something ourselves. Uh, so that's the best way to um, follow us for the latest updates. Amazing, thank you. And Mark, what about yourself? Uh, Bancor, Twitter and Carbon DeFi Twitter, I would say, and you know, I mentioned Velocimeter earlier in the call, if I may, just really quickly, they are the first licensee um, to be working with Bancor. I want to give them a proper shout out because while Bancor deployed the ARB Fastlane themselves on Phantom, it was Velocimeter who deployed another of Bancor's technologies. That was the, the, those were the smart contracts powering Carbon DeFi. So I want to, their product is called Graphene, um, Velocimeter and Graphene, and Bancor's ARB Fastlane are all live on Phantom. So I want to give them a proper shout out, um, not only to follow Phantom Foundation and Bancor and Carbon DeFi, but Velocimeter as well, and to check out Graphene also. Yes, absolutely. They were, um, they, um, they're the ones that took the initiative to um, to actually get the um, the product up and running on Phantom, and so the I think a lot of the the credit is certainly um, it, 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 all of the credit is 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 due to them. Um, and yeah, I would just want to say you know publicly that I think that they're uh, a great uh, a great group of people, and I'm uh, I very much enjoyed working with them, and I'm looking forward to continuing to working with them to uh, develop the product on on Phantom and attract a, a new phantom community to uh um to a, a different try to different kind of trading experience well it's nice to see two that i've been building in the industry for so long like finally coming together you know so it's great to see thank you guys both so much for joining me michael it's been a pleasure thank you again um mark thank you everybody i will add all of the links that we mentioned in the call to the description below, along with the latest update from the Phantom Foundation and from Bancor. Um, thank you all for joining us. And if you're going to be at any of the upcoming conferences that were mentioned, please definitely keep an eye out for Phantom and for Bancor. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you, Jen. Thank you so much.